Hi everyone. Hope you're having a great week and we are almost done with the school year. I think everyone's relieved for that. Um, so we've been talking about the Hundred Years War and the Black Death and Joan of Arc and um, I have another character to bring into play that fits right in the middle of um, the Hundred Years War and that's Geoffrey Chaucer. He is famous for writing a book called the Canterbury Tales. He wrote many, many other works of literature. But I, I guess you all are probably familiar with historical fiction, right? So you're reading The Door in the Wall. It's a story set in a real time period during things that really happened. Um, you see how people were affected by the Black Death, by the way they had to dress or were required um, to behave according to certain social standards. Um, it's an accurately told story about somebody who didn't exist, but experiencing things that did. So the Canterbury Tales is actually kind of one of the first historical fiction um, tales that we have for this time period that we can refer to and that was written really just for the sake of having a fun story. Um, so Canterbury Tales, Geoffrey Chaucer. Um, many people call him the father of English literature. Um, he was one of the first people to write stories in English. Um, Dante wrote in Italian, there were many other writers and storytellers, but he actually took these stories, wrote stories for the sake of having something fun to do, and made it accessible to the common man. Most people say he's the son of a shoemaker, um, so that's what I actually put on the slide, but um, most, it, it appears that he was actually probably the son, that his, his father was a winemaker, he was a vintner, and his mother was a wealthy heiress, so he grew up middle to upper class, which was kind of, um, it was a very small group of people at this point in time, because if you remember, according to the feudal system hierarchy, there wasn't really a middle class or an upper class. You were either titled and noble, or you were a shopkeeper or a peasant. So he was kind of a member of this unusual elite, well-off group of people that knew how to work and use their hands, um, plant grapes and make wine, and but they also had access to education. So he grew up very well educated um, and well traveled and knowledgeable. He was a page to the Countess of Ulster and the Countess of Ulster was married to the second son of Edward III so he was directly tied to the king's court. That apprenticeship was only given to um, sons of people who were well respected and um, well established in society. So because those apprenticeships as pages usually led to a knighthood or a high ranking appointment. Um, so as page, he was given a, a lot of opportunities for education, um, fine clothing, access to music and poetry and other writers. He married a lady in waiting to the queen. Her name was Philippa de Roux. They had three or four children. Um, but during that period, because she was a lady in waiting, they traveled with the king and queen. They traveled with the princes and the counts. They traveled all over Europe. Um, he may have even been on a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. If you remember those pilgrimages, that was where they would uh, go to the holy sites. Jerusalem was, was a pilgrimage, but there were many other holy sites that they could go visit and um, actually receive what they believed it was a spiritual reward for attending. Um, during these travels, he was, uh, again, heavily influenced by Italian poetry, which was much more refined than English poetry at this time. While he was there, um, no, when he got back to England, I'm sorry, he studied law and became a formal member of the court in his own standing. Um, the king would send him on expeditions, um, have him do secret tasks. He actually was very, very uh, close to the king and his wife and their servants. Um, at some point, he fought in the Hundred Years' War and was captured by the enemy and meant so much to the king that he was received a ransom. King Edward also awarded him a gallon of wine daily for life for an unspecified task. We believe that that task may have been his first uh, book collection of poetry. That day that that gallon of wine was awarded was a special day. Uh, St. George's Day is reserved for literary and poetry recognition. So at some point early on, he was writing and um, giving it to the king and sharing it with people and already receiving recognition for it informally, not really noticed. He had many job descriptions. He, because of his rank and his education, he served the king in a lot of different ways. So Geoffrey Chaucer would have been a customs controller. It means he controlled taxes and the way things came in. A justice of the peace. Remember, he had a law degree. He was a member of parliament. 
a diplomat to France and Italy. And remember, we're in the middle of the Hundred Years' War. He served, uh, de delivered secret dispatches for other knights and lords serving the king. Um, and we believe that during these travels, he would get inspiration for his stories in the Canterbury Tales. He supervised construction of Westminster Palace and the Tower of London. Those are two major um, architectural achievements of the time. He was a, after he got injured at some point, he was actually mugged and got hurt. He had to retire from those active jobs and was given the job of deputy forester, which basically meant he could go live in a really nice house in one of the, some of the king's forest land and um, watch over it with a pension. He died of unknown causes around 1400. So he was born in the 1340s and died around 1400. So he's probably less than 60 years old. And he was the first writer to be buried in the poet's corner of Westminster Abbey. Let's talk about that for just a minute. Or you guys can pause this at any time to go back and take your notes. So Westminster Abbey is kind of one of the major church homes of the Church of England. Um, it's just spectacular and has amazing stained glass and uh, Gothic architecture. I mean, we've talked about that before. So here's Westminster Abbey, and inside Westminster Abbey is what we call the Poet's Corner. Many famous poets are buried here, but Chaucer was the first after he was buried. Um, other famous poets that have that who are entombed there are uh, Robert Browning, Alfred Tennyson, Charles Dickens is even buried there, and George Frederick Handel, Rudyard Kipling here with the Jungle Book, and then um, after they kind of filled up the tomb area, they started putting up memorial plaques for people. I mean, there's countless memorials in this section of the Westminster Abbey, but C.S. Lewis and Jane Austen have memorial plaques there. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, you see Keats and Shelley memorials up on this wall here. Just all, all, those, all those names that you know, they at least have a memorial or, or their bodies are actually entombed here. So Chaucer was number one and you can see him back over here in the corner. Let's talk about his story for a minute. Um, here's a famous quote, although Chaucer's invented personages, the people in his stories, are now 600 years old, they are flesh and blood today. They are in fact the people whom we have known all of our lives. So these stories, and you will read the original Canterbury Tales probably in high school or college, these stories relate to people today in so an entertaining, such an entertaining way because they are real, they have all the flaws and faults that we have. They make the same kinds of jokes. Um, they have the same kinds of problems, so they're very relatable. And the way it was written was so entertaining because of the rhyming scheme that he used. It was very unusual, and it still is. Now, Canterbury Tales, Chaucer's masterpiece, also called his magnum opus. He was the first writer to use English in a major literary work. Um, So he's remembered as the father of the English language because he blended the Saxon words, French words, and Latin words, and words that he just made up. In doing so, he created a language that is the basis for English today. He had gathered words from his own life experiences growing up in London and traveling around Europe. So if you remember that we had this in one of our quizzes, that, that Middle English, the cross of French and English that happened, an Anglo-Saxon that happened when William the Conqueror came to England. People weren't writing in this yet. It was still a developing language because the higher up ranking people spoke only French still, the king and his court, and then the poor peasants still spoke an Anglo-Saxon Saxon derivative. So this melding of languages and culture was still happening two to three hundred years later. A hundred years wars going on, English people still hate French, French still hate English, but whether they like it or not, those two cultures are really officially meshed and combined. And having that written, having that expressed was valuable to the English language and actually affects how we speak today. So this story is set with a scene from 1387. The month is April and the place is the Tabard Inn in London, England, which is a real place. It makes that part of the story fact. So he sets his story in a real place, in a real time, with real lifelike people and things that would have happened. It's a cross-section of medieval society in his story. In, in this tale, he shows almost all the professions of the 14th century and people's characteristics from folly to wisdom. And it's 17,000 lines of poetry. And again, they're written in Middle English, and here's a sample. 
So here's the Lord's Prayer. Our Father that art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come to thee. Be thy will done on earth as in heaven. Give to us this day our bread over our other substance and forgive to us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So this frame tale, this tale that's set in a real place, this fictional historical story, a frame tale is a story that provides a frame or a setting for telling other stories. So in the story, you have 29 pilgrims traveling to the shrine of St. Thomas of Becket. You have 29 pilgrims traveling. And you remember, the pilgrimage is a trip to a holy place. And this particular group of pilgrims is going to visit this shrine and where Chaucer uses history to build his story. For in real life, thousands of people every year went to visit the tomb of Becket in the town of Canterbury, England. Thomas of Becket was a godly man who had been murdered in 1170 by friends of Henry II. We learned about that in Lesson 59. An elaborate burial site of gold, gems, and ornate carvings had been built in his honor. It was a site we're seeing then and is now. As the story goes, the 30 pilgrims, because Chaucer includes himself in this, are stopping at Tabard Inn for a rest from their journey. There they meet a kindly innkeeper, and he notices their weariness and comes up with an idea to boost the morale. He suggests that each traveler tell four stories while on the road, two on the way to Beckett's shrine and two on the way home. To make it more interesting, the innkeeper suggests that at the end of their journey, all of them pitch in to give a free meal to the best storyteller of the group. So the prologue of this story of stories introduces the pilgrims and they proceed to have their, con uh, their contest. However, we believe that the tales are incomplete, which is kind of a tragedy, um, because he only completed one-fifth of the tales. He died before he could finish. Those he completed are still a masterpiece, and unlike Dante's great work, which is in Italian, we can read Chaucer's work in its original English language, catching all of the rhymes and rhythms as they exist. So, we have a list of that cross-section of medieval society. They ref all of the people in it represent the three main areas of society. Um, and he gives a small random selection that represents the larger whole. So we have the court, the church, and the commoners. Those are the three main parts of society. Within the court, we have a knight, a squire, a yeoman, a franklin, a plowman, a miller, and a reeve. And we'll talk about who, what those are later. And from the church, we have a nun, a monk, a friar, a cleric, a parson, a summoner, and a pardoner. From the commoners, we have a merchant, a sergeant of the law, five tradesmen, a cook, a skipper, a doctor, a wife of a man of Bath, a manciple, and a host. Now I have a couple of excerpts from each of these people that I wanted to read to you. From the court, we have a knight. Here's what Chaucer writes of him. A knight there was, and that a worthy man, that from the very time he first began to ride abroad, had loved high chivalry truth and all honor, freedom and courtesy, and in his bearing, meek as is a maid. He never had in all his lifetime said an ill-bred word to serf or man of might. He was a very perfect, gentle knight. Second <clears throat> from this list, we have the miller. And really, the miller isn't always considered a member of the court, but in this, in this case, this was the king's miller. The miller, Robin, was a thick-set lout, so big of bone and brawn, so broad and stout, that he was champion wrestler at the matches. He'd even break a door right off his latches by running at it with his burly head. His beard, broad as a spade, was fiery red, his mouth a yawning furnace, you'd suppose. A wart with bristly hairs stood on his nose. His share of grain, he sneaked the payment thrice. The jokes and tales he told were not so nice. A drunken vulgar rogue he proved to be, but yet he played the bagpipe cleverly. And to its tune he led us out of town, a blue hood wore he, and a short white gown. And we have a member of the church, we have a nun. There was a nun, a pleasant prioress, this lady's smile was coy, I must confess. Her table manners were indeed a treat, with dainty grace she reached to take her meat. Her upper lip she wiped so very clean that never was the slightest fraction seen of grease within the rim upon her cup. She never let a morsel she took up drop down upon her breast, nor did she wet her fingers in her sauce too deep. And yet, in spite of all her social poise and art, she had a very, very tender heart. Upon my word, this prioress would cry to see a mouse caught in a trap and die. 
The last member of the church would be a parson, and he took the journey too. He was a scholar, learned, wise, and true, and rich in holiness through poor and gold. A gentle priest, whenever he was told that poor folks could not meet their tithes that year, he paid them up himself. For priests, it's clear, could be content with little in God's way. He lived Christ's gospel truly every day. He was a Christian, both in deed and thought. He lived himself, the golden rule he taught. Now, Chaucer is, one of the things he's best known for is loving Christianity and everything that the gospel stood for, while mocking and being frustrated with the corruption in the church that he saw developing. Okay, we have the wife of Bath from our commoners. We have an excerpt from her. A wife of Bath did much to keep us gay with tales of love and love charms on the way. A lively soul who knew the inmost art of how to win a spouse and hold his heart. For she had had five husbands in her time, not counting scores of lovers in her prime. She'd grown a little deaf, but not she cared. Now forth to foreign lands each year she fared. Since fate decreed she seek out every shrine. Her teeth grew far apart, a certain sign that she should travel far. She'd seen Bouillon and Rome and Palestine, Spain and Cologne. The towering headdress worn upon her hair on Sunday weighed a full ten pounds, I'd swear. The mantle round her waist did not conceal red stockings and a spur upon each heel. She kept the other pilgrims all in gales of laughter, listening to her merry tales. So besides being very entertaining, Chaucer included some of the main things he included about society and the problems and the good things that he saw within it. Um, other important notes are that the setting is in springtime, which he chose carefully. It represents fertility, rebirth, spring fever, which is referred to throughout this piece. The themes are cor the corruption of the church. And remember, he still respected Christianity. He was a Christian. Um, he writes throughout his ent this entire work about how important it is to, to follow Christ's example. But the church was a major issue to him. It had too much power. There was no separation between church and state. Um, and he really saw that corruption as a problem and that it was building. He also wrote about the complexity of human nature. So the two themes are the cor corruption of church and the complexity of human nature. Very few characters are all good or all bad, since we all have our virtues and our flaws. He included irony. S often the characters typically valued by society are the most despicable, while the poor and lowly are the more noble. And tied into the irony is humor. The descriptions bickering between characters and the irony in the tales are meant to be funny. So here are some medieval occupations explained, and I believe you have these in your notes. So take a moment, I'm not going to read these out loud, but take a moment to um, pause this and write those out so that you can remember what those characters are. And here you have a few more descriptions. The summoner that was underneath that church section is someone who brings accused criminals before the church's court. Um, if you notice, the church has the court that is judging the criminals. Um, in our day, we have bounty hunters, we have uh, detectives, people who will go find the accused criminals and bring them to court, but it's not run by the church. Um, this is where he saw the church having too much power. Uh, the nun, or the monk, they are known for devoting their lives to work, obviously charity and prayer. They take vows of poverty, silence, and chastity, which we've talked about these. Often, becoming a monk was an option for second sons of nobility who could not inherit the family fortune. Um, you'll notice that even just in the section of poetry that I read to you, it mentions a lot of physical characteristics. So during this time, like today, certain physical characteristics were associated with personality. Gap teeth, like the wife of Bath, was considered cute and um, meant you probably had uh, good karma, good things coming for you, and you were destined for good things. Curly hair was fashionable. To have a red face meant that you were strong and lusty. Red hair could mean that you were sneaky like a fox. A lot of people with red hair would be called the fox as the, like a, a tagged on name. Um, having a wide forehead was beautiful. Long hair in a man was considered weak and undesirable. And a beardless man was also considered weak and immature. And if you had sores or pimples, um, it would suggest that you had disease. So that was really, really looked down upon. All right. So Geoffrey Chaucer, mid-40s, 1340s, died 1400. Didn't get to finish the story, but did create um, a large collection of works. Um, and this one is the most entertaining and memorable. So I'm going to close out with the story of Chanticleer and the Fox, as told by the nun's priest in the tale. 
Remember, the priest is fictitious. Chaucer really wrote all these tales, but this is almost like an Aesop's fable that everybody could relate to and taught a lesson. In this fanciful fable, Chanticleer is a, a proud rooster who is tormented over a bad dream. His wife, a pretty little hen, scolds him in a nagging tone for being afraid, and she says, Have you a beard and called yourself a man? I cannot love a coward. No woman can. We want our husbands hardy, wise, and free. What is a dream? Nothing but vanity. It may arise from eating too rich food. If you notice, she says you've got a beard, but you're not acting like a man. And there's that reference to a, men without a beard being weak and immature. With this, Chanticleer struts about the yard, deciding not to be afraid. Full of new pride and confidence, he speaks with the fox. The fox flatters Chanticleer by begging him to sing a pretty song. But it turns out to be a trick. As soon as Chanticleer stretches out his neck to project his great voice, the fox grabs him by the throat and carries him off. Well, not to be outdone by the fox, Chanticleer, still in the clutches of the fox, utters to the fox that he ought to shout to the rest of the barnyard how he cleverly caught the rooster. The fox falls for the very trick of flattery that he played upon Chanticleer. As soon as the fox opens his jaws to brag, the rooster flies away free, and the moral of the story is summed up very well by the fox. He says, Nay, quoth the fox, and God shall never cease to plague the chattering tongue that should keep peace. Lo, thus it goes with carelessness, you see, and with too great a trust in flattery. And so Chaucer is here using his tale to put fun at the flaws of mankind, and that's what makes Canterbury Tales a classic. For though customs have changed since the Middle Ages, the nature of mankind has remained much the same. So make sure you filled out all of your notes. If you need to go back, that's the beauty of this video. You don't have to stop me and raise your hand. You can pause and back up and figure out what you missed or what's you found most interesting and rewatch it. Um, if you have any questions, email me and I will see you all next week.